You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Do you believe that this could produce a multi-generational buying opportunity sometime in the future? I absolutely do. You're going to have to be selective about it. You can't put all your money to work now. Welcome back to Mining Stock Education. I am your host, Bill Powers. Thanks for tuning in. In these volatile times, if you want to engage uh, the content of this show, feel free to email me at bill at miningstockeducation.com. And over this past week, you've heard a variety of perspectives on these very unique and perhaps unprecedented things that we're seeing in the markets. And today you're going to get to hear from a new voice, at least on this show. If you follow well-respected commentators online and through different shows, you already know of who my guest is today. I'm talking about Chris Temple. He is is the National Investor. You can find his website at nationalinvestor.com. He has several decades of investing in the various financial sectors and experience uh, commentating on what is occurring. So Chris, thanks for coming on Mining Stock Education uh, for your first time. And for my first question, I want you to comment on the market action that we're seeing. Can we be certain? I know some friends, high net worth friends that have sold their entire positions. They were mostly focused in the mining sector, but they just said there's too much uncertainty. I can't legitimately predict what's going to happen or even take an educated guess. So therefore, I'm just going to cash. Uh, what's your perspective here? Well, good morning, Bill. And thanks for having me on board. First of all, uh, look, this this is something that nobody has experience with. Uh, I was greeted when I first got in this business by the bear market and recession and the hyperinflation, uh, or, or we were going that direction and high interest rates of the late 70s and into the early 80s and several episodes since then, 1987, you know, several instances in the latter 90s of currency crises in Asia and Russia, long-term capital, the tech bust, uh, the, the crisis in 2008. But this is, this is a new one. This is something nobody alive today has any experience with, uh, certainly not in the modern age, and nobody can predict what is going to come. That part is true. What I did say the other day in talking just this in this one sense, Bill, about the big picture is that, and I wrote this in a commentary this last weekend on my website, one major difference between this present time and 2008 is that back then, the powers that be thought that they might want to keep just a little bit of moral hazard in the markets. They let Lehman Brothers go bust. They let a couple other dominoes start to fall. And they said, uh oh, uh, if we don't bail everybody out, we've got a problem. And so today, what are we seeing? Notwithstanding the fact that the Fed, with some of the mechanisms it's done, was a little bit late to the game. They zigged when they should have zagged, especially last Sunday night in cutting interest rates, which was a monstrous, monumental mistake when they should have done less of that and more of the other things they're catching up on now. You know, we've got a situation where between them and the other central banks and the governments, they're not going to do what they did in 2008. They're going to throw the, everybody's kitchen sink. They're going to take, they're going to dismantle the space shuttle and throw the sinks on that thing at the markets. By the time we get done here, if Bill, you are a card player, for example, and your buddy Charlie uh, the other night went all in and, and, and blew his hand up, and uh, had to give you a, an IOU for the money he owes you. Before this is all done, you can take that to Jerome Powell and he'll monetize that too. So that's the difference between today and 2008. Does it mean we're at the bottom? No. Does it mean that there isn't more pain to come? No. Uh, the economic impact of this is going to be felt in various ways for years. But as far as the liquidity and functioning of the markets, and, and yeah, it could get uglier first, you're going to see stuff that you've never seen from governments and central banks also. Do you believe that this could produce a multi-generational buying opportunity sometime in the future? I absolutely do. You're going to have to be selective about it. You can't put all your money to work now. Uh, I like what Mark Cuban, the uh, entrepreneur and, and Dallas Mavericks owner, said a couple of mornings ago, which I repeated and actually adding back a couple stocks to my own recommended list. You know, when you see big down days, and there can't be that many of them left unless we're going to go back to the Stone Age. When you see a big down day 
you look at your shopping list of companies that you want to own a year or two from now. And notwithstanding the possibility that you might see them drop further in the near term, they get to a place where you say, okay, company A and company B, I'm going to start nibbling at today. You've still got to have the majority of your portfolio in cash right now. Make no mistake about that. You don't put a lot of money to work yet, but you can start putting some. You know, Notably, Jeff Gunlock of DoubleLine uh, announced yesterday that for the first time in several years, he no longer has short positions in the U.S. stock market. He closed out the last of them yesterday. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. Trilogy Metals is a world-class developer in Alaska's Ambler Mining District. The company already possesses 8 billion pounds of high-grade copper, 3 billion pounds of zinc, over 1 million gold equivalent ounces, and over 77 million pounds of cobalt. Trilogy's Arctic project boasts an after-tax net present value of $1.4 billion with a 33% internal rate of return. Trilogy is led by an experienced management team with proven success in discovering and developing projects in Alaska. The company is well capitalized, has no debt, and possesses strong institutional support. Trilogy trades in New York and Toronto under the ticker TMQ. To learn more, go to TrilogyMetals.com. That's TrilogyMetals.com. When you look at the silver miners, you track the precious metal sector, both the stocks and the price of the metals. Silver's under $12 an ounce, which is below what most miners can produce it for. Yet you have stocks like Mag Silver, which isn't in production yet. But just to take that one as an example, it's up like in the last three days, something like over 80% off of its bottom. So What's going on here? Do you think that people are trying to be contrary and say that silver can't stay this low for too long, therefore they're buying up the stock? Or does this have something to do with GDX or GDXJ buying mag silver to push it up? Help me understand what's going on here. Well, first of all, Bill, we got to go back a few weeks. The day that GDX and GDXJ peaked, I told people to start selling. And I actually pointed out that afternoon that there was already margin calls coming that were hitting those stocks. You know, fast forward to last Friday, when you had the triple leveraged ETFs like Nugget and JNUG, which were the big tail that wagged these dogs, they imploded, took everything with them. So you had lots of stocks in the mining space, gold and silver both, that overshot obscenely to the downside. So whether it's a mag silver or anything else you wanna look at right now, you first had this last Monday, the disconnect between the prices of the ETFs and the underlying securities where you had them end last week trading at 10% plus below their net asset value, that got done away with. So you had part of a bounce from that, part of it from bottom fishers. But I, for a while, have made a distinction between the gold and silver spaces. I got bullish on gold at the end of 2018. I'm still screamingly bullish going forward, even though I told people to lighten up, thank God, when we were at the peak for the sector recently. Uh, silver is a different story. Uh, you can't give me silver stocks. You can't give me copper companies right now. Uh, down the road, they're going to be great because once all of this quantitative easing and all of the other tricks, some of which we never dreamed of, come and and first, you, and people need to understand this, because a lot of people, especially some metals gurus, didn't learn their lesson after the financial crisis. Understand that for right now, Bill, all of this stuff the central banks are doing is the last thing it is is inflationary right now. We've had hyperinflation for 10 or 11 years since the financial crisis. It is now cascading downward in deflation. Trillions and trillions of dollars have been vaporized already and will continue to be. So for now, all that the policymakers and central banks are going to succeed in doing, hopefully, is mitigating the deflation that is already underway, that has already happened, and that will remain ongoing. Now, this time, unlike 2008, they will probably do enough to where somewhere down the road when they've beat back deflation. And you got two issues now, not just one. You don't have just this virus. You've got this oil war and geostrategic war over oil with Russia and Saudi Arabia, et cetera, that threatens our entire shale industry. That isn't even being discussed right now, but very much 
when you've got this virus thing going on. It longer term is a more di- uh, sinister issue, frankly, for our markets. And so we need to get past the immediate deflationary impact of these things. Once we do, there's going to be zillions and gazillions and whatnot of new dollars and yen and euros floating around that will finally bring us to a place where there will be some reflation. But between now and then, um, aside from gold, I, you know, you're going to get huge dead cap bounces in a lot of things. You know, when, when we get to the place not far from now, frankly, where we can put this coronavirus thing in a rearview mirror and get back to the other problems we already had, you will have monstrous rallies in stocks, oil, silver, copper, everything. But you're going to have to distinguish, once we do, between the stuff you're going to be able to stick with and not. And that'll be a decision we make when that time comes. Could a reflation trade still be a couple years out? It could be. We don't know yet. I mean, a lot of things, uh, again, are unknown. We, we've, th- we're we reinventing the playbook here, writing a new one, however you want to put it. We've never dealt with this before. So I do think that you're going to have a point because there's still, for, for the liquidity issues that are going on in the marketplace, one of which I warned of a while ago when people were saying, oh, the dollar's done, it might go down. I said, hey, if the dollar is going to make a huge move, the risk is it will be to the upside. We've seen that despite the Fed's efforts. That is the clear and present danger right now to this deflation getting worse. So we've got to break the back of the dollar's move somehow uh, and and have some of this uh, quantitative easing and these other things get some traction so that we first get the bounce. And, and then we're going to have to settle things out. I think we're going to have the next move down after we get a reflexive bounce is going to be a grinding one, Bill. I don't think it's going to be nearly as dramatic as what we've had, but it could still be a grinding one with still the predominant uh, force being deflation until we really get this thing licked. And, yeah, it could be could be six or eight months, could be two years. We just don't know yet. Chris, in some of my private conversations with savvy investors over the last week, I've been told that. Um, from some that there's an expectation that when we see that reflation come in, you'll see the general equities going up, you'll see gold going up, and you'll see the gold stocks going up all at the same time. Would that be your expectation also? Absolutely. I think the rebound will will pick everything up. Uh, One of the reasons I didn't like the gold stocks generally, I stuck with some individual ones that got their brains kicked in just like the rest. But, you know, the predominant part of our portfolios that we're in GDX and GDXJ. We at least got out of those when, when they were at their peak. Uh, but I didn't like them at the time because they were moving in lockstep with a market, number one. And number two, and this again is key, you know, people sometimes get tunnel vision if they're a gold bug or a silver bug. And hey, philosophically, I'm as much or more of a gold bug as anybody. I hope, for example, that one of the th- things that we see is the fallout of this pain that we're all going through is some major reform. I would love to see Trump come out and say, I'm going to abolish the Fed and we're going to have a nationalized social credit system where we don't have to borrow our own money anymore and get ourselves into this mess. I'm not holding my breath. I would love to see that. But look, that said, my position has always been that you need to look at what other people are doing because 99.7% of individual investors out there, and I'm just throwing out that number for, you know, drama's sake, I guess, but 99.7% of investors out there are not gold bugs. A lot of them jumped into this rally in gold and gold stocks over the last year or so because it made sense. It was a momentum trade. It was where some good money was to be found. Uh, I was calling for a while uh, the, the moves up in tandem of gold and treasury bonds, the odd couple, because traditionally they wouldn't go up at the same time, but they did. So it wasn't gold bugs that panicked and started selling. It was all of the the quant funds, the the non-gold bug investors, most of them hedge funds and institutions who chase the momentum and all of a sudden it starts to unravel and they sell. Then things unravel worse and you saw both treasuries and gold get hit 
because instead of selling stuff they probably should have been in in the first place, like junk bonds and shale companies and overpriced momentum stocks and things like that, they sold what was liquid, liquid and what looked good and they had profits in, and that was the gold space and that was treasuries. What are some good, uh, sectors that are attracting your attention, even if you're not ready to jump in yet? Other than the mining sector, what might be some hot sectors once we do see a turn? Well, I think that if you are very careful, first of all, Bill, in looking at yield-oriented stocks, um, all of which got caught up in the selling, you're going to see when things settle out, the likelihood that we're not still any time in the very near future going to go significantly higher again in terms of treasury bond yields. You know, we've had a lot of weird things go on in the market. They got severely compressed at their low. You know, the 30-year the bond even was something like 70 basis points at its low. Now it's back about 170. It could go a little bit higher. But long term, even though the Fed will be unleashing more inflationary pressures, they cannot afford to let Treasury yields go higher. So they'll stay fairly well behaved as things settle out. Meantime, a lot of stuff, good companies, uh, you know, real estate investment trusts in, in different areas, apartments, healthcare facilities, things like that. Even the better pipeline companies that have especially been annihilated in this drop in oil, you've got really good companies right now yielding well into the double digits and no business being there. So I, I'm starting, in fact, right now, bit by bit, adding a company here and a company there. Uh, I love uranium because that's a secular story that is independent of almost anything going on uh, with its individual fundamentals. Uh, and another thing I like that's going to help some of the rare earths and lithium and things like that is that one of the things I talked about in my most recent issue, Bill, is that among the fallout, uh, and there's so many things we can't even think of yet. This is all a work in progress, of course. Nobody can be an expert today. But one thing I'll throw out there is that we already saw in the world, and especially in the U.S. because of the political situation we've had here and the Trump administration pushing this already, a move to start bringing supply chains back home. That move is going to go into overdrive as a result of all this stuff. So even though the beating in the market and the cheap oil price has pushed farther into the future for now, a much bigger rollout of electric vehicles and that whole sector of the economy, it's still coming. And if you can find companies in North America that are the best in, in lithium and the other battery type metals, again, even though near term, the picture is not as good as it was, longer term, it's still great. And especially those companies are going to meet the needs of Detroit and Toronto and, and or over in Windsor, places like that is the automobile industry gets more and more toward electric vehicles. They don't want lithium from South America. They sure as hold, hell don't want it from Asia. They want it from North America. So that's going to be a great theme going forward for those to pick the right mining stocks to fill those needs. Chris, you referenced Detroit. I live near the Motor City. And one of my friends texted me last night. He's like, hey, Bill, Ford Motor Company fell in half in the last 30 days. Do you think I should buy it? Uh, if you were answering that text message, what would you say? I'd say not yet. <laughs> that's what I said. I said, stay on the sidelines because I think it could fall farther. It could. It makes sense. It's attractive. And again, one of the things that we're looking at already and, and, and how even though the Fed totally screwed this up, th th there's not a worse decision in 107 years of the central bank than what they did this last Sunday night. Now they got to clean up, clean up the mess and do more of what they should have done earlier. Now that is already taking place. They're backstopping money market funds using the exchange stabilization fund and other things. Mm -hmm. Politically, I don't believe that Congress would ever allow a bailout of too many industries that really are shaky, and I'm speaking of the shale industry. Uh, they'll probably give a lifeline to the airlines, even though, as a lot of people have pointed out, you know, Boeing blew $40 billion or something like that on buying stock back and financial engineering to help the, uh, you know, upper echelon of management. Now they got their hand out. Uh, and I think it's good that so far Larry Kudlow, who's, who I, I have mixed feelings about at times, was was really good in coming out yesterday and saying, look, we're, we know we're going to have to do some of this, but we're going to do it as a wise investor. And just like the government had to bail out a company like General Motors last time around, they got stock, 
General Motors got back on its feet and the government actually made money on a deal. There's going to be an awful lot of that coming uh, ahead. But back to the shale industry real quick, you are going to unquestionably see the Federal Reserve's powers increased almost exponentially as far as what they can do and what they can buy. Even before things got you know, worse again by a couple more steps this week, the Boston Fed President Eric Rosengren was saying, hey, we need to be able to step into the corporate bond market. We need to do this. We need to do that. And, and like I said earlier in our discussion, when all is said and done, if you've got a bad gambling chip from your buddy, it's an IOU that he's not going to pay up on. Give it to the Fed and they'll, they'll give you the money. If the Fed's power increases, couldn't at the same time their overall influence on the market decrease, though? Exactly right. And that's an ex excellent point, because even with all of this stuff, Bill, I think that, the you know, the, the bloom is off the rose. We've seen the man behind the curtain, especially Sunday night, Jerome Powell. His, his, his underwear was soiled because he was so panicked. And what he did, you know, it's not this magical wizard behind a curtain. It's a very mortal and very frightened man. So as I said earlier, I hope that we're going to see some institutional changes of a major kind going forward. Uh, I'm not holding my breath. I'll certainly be pushing for it and what I say and, and write and so forth. But yeah, and, and I'll tell you another thing that's going to come down the road that already was getting stronger because of how the passive investing scheme on Wall Street was making everything less and less real. Private equity, stuff that's not done within the confines of Wall Street, the private market, you're going to see better price discovery. So again, this is, this is something that we've never seen this in our lifetimes, hopefully never will. A lot of changes are going to come, but you, I think you hit a nail on the head there in saying that even though the Fed is going to get all of these powers, you know, they're not going to be as well thought of as they were. And people are going to, you know, realize going forward that we can't depend on them all the time. Chris, as we conclude, for my listeners that aren't familiar with your work or your subscription service, what does your website and subscription service offer? Well, if you go to nationalinvestor.com, uh, as lots and lots of people do, and you do it, I do it, I, there's a lot of stuff on my site, commentaries, a lot of new ones, a lot of uh, old ones that will give you an idea and a flavor for what I do. I don't follow any one sector. Uh, I try and give people a big picture view of the economy and markets and, and give people some sound guidance without any preconceived notions. You know, I'm not a perma bear or perma bull on anything. Uh, but I try and give people the best and soundest advice I can. So just go to my website, check it out. If you like what you see and you want to become a member and get all of my specific recommendations, there's a subscribe or renew link there. And even though the NCAA uh, has canceled March Madness, at least as far as uh, crowds showing up, we've got our own March Madness there for for folks where if you sign up for a certain term, you'll get double that term and the details are on the site. You've been listening to Chris Temple, the national investor, nationalinvestor.com. Chris, thanks for coming on the show today. I appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure, Bill. Let's stay in touch.